Let's start to analyze velocities of machines and bodies of size as the book does rather than using the instant centers I use everywhere. The book does talk about instant centers, but to reconcile their method with mine and what they're talking about when they say instant centers, they use only ground-based instant centers. So that would be an I1 and then body number. They don't talk about or use or take advantage of instant centers that are instant centers between two bodies that are both moving. Uh, they do, but they don't call them that, and they don't, um, they don't recognize them as instant centers and use the kennedy arnholt theorem as we have learned to do. So we'll go through a few slides. Uh, there's some things I'll skip in the slides, in particular example problems, but since these slides are available to you, please download them and look through them and follow along in the example problems. Of course, I have my own example problems I want you to watch, uh, but hopefully seeing the method from a couple of different perspectives will help you understand it better. So let's start off with the group problem solving. Uh, normally in class, of course, I would um, present this as a question and have discussion. Uh, so what I'll try to do is maybe read through this, uh, confuse you a little bit, <laughs> and then explain what principles are at work here and how you should approach a problem like this. And you know, one of the big problems that students have in a class like this, especially dynamics, is how do you even start? Uh, how do you figure out what equations to use? How do you approach? Well, the way you approach a dynamics problem is always to think about it as intuitively as you can. Just think about, you know, if it's moving this way, what happens? How does that work? What do I know about this? Just from my own understanding. I'll show you what I mean. Let's read through it. A series of small machine components, those are the little boxes, uh, being moved by a conveyor belt, that's the little blue thin strip there, uh, let's see, pass over a six inch radius pulley, or idler pulley, so we see that, the six inch idler pulley, it's got point B at the top of it. At the instant shown, the velocity of point A is 15 inches per second to the left. So if you look at point A, it's part of the conveyor belt, and they said to the left, but you shouldn't think of that as strictly due west, right? That's not what they mean. They mean that it's moving down and to the left. There, this is a conveyor. The, the belt's not going to just all of a sudden translate over to the left. It's constrained by the rollers and things that you see there. So you have to understand it somewhat intuitively first, like I said before. Its acceleration is nine inches per second squared to the right. So in other words, point A is moving down and to the left at a certain speed, but it's slowing down. Okay, so how long would it take to slow down? Well, you can figure that out pretty easily. If it's moving, let's make the math really easy. Let's just pretend for the moment it's moving at 18 inches per second and it decelerates nine inches per second every second. Well, that would take two seconds. Since the deceleration rate is a number less than 15 seconds, that means it's gonna take more than a second for it to slow down. Now, of course, to actually calculate the time, just take the 15 inches per second and divide it by nine inches per second, whatever number you get. I could do that, but it's late and I'm too tired to do it right now. You figure it out. That's how long it would take for it to, to slow down. See, all we're doing is we're exploring the problem. We're thinking about it, trying to understand it and make sure that everything that's given clicks with us intuitively, that we look at these things and say, yeah, I, I really know what that means. Determine A, the angular velocity and angular acceleration of the idler pulley. So that's the big, it almost looks like a film canister or something. And B, the total acceleration of the machine component at B. Now, the idler pulley is not so bad. That's going to be an alpha, right? It's going to be an angular acceleration. That's the the uh, symbol we would give to it. Omega is the angular velocity, but alpha would be the angular acceleration. Um, the total acceleration of the machine component at B, what are they really asking there? Well, the problem with these, well, the issue I would say with your understanding typically of these kinds of problems is that you probably use your intuition a little too much in thinking, well, this box that's on top, it came from the right, it's moving to the left, i got to somehow figure out what's going on in that whole path. No, you don't. All we really care about is this one position. And I can't stress that enough in this chapter. The velocities and accelerations we come up with are highly position dependent. As a matter of fact, there's a general solution strategy you should be thinking of in this chapter. And that is that first you should always solve the geometry problem. Whatever ge geometry there is, you need to know where all the points of interest that are really relevant are located. 
Now point A we don't care so much about because all we're really going to do is relate the motion that's given for point A to the motion of point B. Um, but for example, the six inch diameter is very important. It's important to understand that the distance from the center of rotation of the pulley up to point B is six inches. And that can be confusing for students because you might say, well, didn't they say we care about the machine component that's being conveyed on the belt, so don't I need the height of that component? Well, understand what we're doing here is assuming that the size of that machine component is so small we can treat it as a point. And that point is located at the, the surface of conveyor belt B. Some of the approximations we're making is that that conveyor belt is infinitesimally thin. And because you live in the real world, making these leaps is a stumbling block along the way of solving this sort of problem. But anyway, so let's think about what we're going to do. Why did they give us point A? Well, they gave us point A because they didn't want to give away point B, right? What they wanted to do was ask us about point B. So what's the difference between point A and point B? Well, they're both on the conveyor, and they're both going to move at the same speed, right? So what's the difference? Well, what did we just figure out? Well, we figured out that point B is moving due west to the left at this instant in time for this position, moving to the left at 15 inches per second. That's good to know. What else did we figure out? Well, B's kind of going over a hump. What does that mean? That means it's traveling on a circle right now. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means it's going to have a normal acceleration because it's on a circular path. Remember when a point is traveling on a circular path, it has normal acceleration. And B certainly has normal acceleration pointed from B to the center of the pulley because that's where the center of the curvature of the path that B is on is located. It also has a tangential acceleration because A has a tangential acceleration. Understand that A, that acceleration that was given for A is 9 inches per second squared to the right, essentially. B is going to have that same tangential piece. So the difference between A and B is that A has only tangential acceleration, in other words, acceleration in the direction of its velocity, whereas B has tangential and normal acceleration. And those are the keys for figuring out the answers to these questions. So let's move on. Um, so the solution using the linear velocity accelerations, calculate the angular velocity acceleration, and that's what I was saying. In particular, what equation would you use for the next part using the angular velocity determine the normal acceleration? Wouldn't that be a v squared over rho sort of thing? Because to calculate normal acceleration, it's always just the tangential velocity squared over rho. So what you would do is take 15 inches per second squared divided by 6 inches. That's the normal acceleration. I kind of skipped over the first problem. I, I didn't mean to. Uh, the, using the linear velocity and accelerations, calculate the angular velocity and acceleration. Well, the angular velocity is really easy. All you have to do is realize that linear velocity v equals omega times r. Well, really, it's omega cross r, but neglecting the, the uh, vector part of this and just dealing with it as a scalar and determining the, the, the sense of rotation ourselves is trivial, right? I mean, the, the rotation of the pulley is if you were to use the right-hand rule, is in the direction of your thumb coming out of the page, right? It's, it's that simple. That takes care of the vector, the direction part. But what about the magnitude? Well, the angular velocity, v equals omega r, so v over r would be omega. So if we take the velocity of 15 inches per second divided by 6 inches, that's the uh, angular speed of the pulley. Now, the angular acceleration, what you have to remember about angular acceleration is that it's not related to normal acceleration. Normal acceleration goes with angular velocity, but tangential acceleration is what goes with angular acceleration. Those two go hand in hand. And the equation's a whole lot like V equals omega R. It's actually acceleration, the tangential piece, tangential, tangential acceleration, equals alpha R. So it looks just like the one for... Um, uh, velocities, angular velocities, related to linear velocities. It's just that you have to remember this is the tangential piece of the acceleration only that's related to the angular acceleration of the body. So if we know the tangential acceleration, what we do, they gave it to us, it's 9 inches per second squared. All we have to do then is take that, that tangential piece, 9 inches per second squared, and divide it by the radius 6 inches again, and there's your uh, angular acceleration alpha. Now, Students often get confused about this because the units look odd. For angular velocity, you get 1 over seconds, or 1 over time, essentially. And for angular acceleration, you get 1 over second squared. Well, you remember, radians you can throw in or pull out whenever you need it. Radians can disappear for free, or you can throw it into the equation when you need to talk about a, 
uh, and circular type thing. So in this case, radians would come in for free, and what I've just suggested would give you angular velocity in radians per second and angular acceleration alpha in radians per second squared. Finally, determine the total acceleration using the tangential and normal acceleration components of B. So since we have the normal acceleration, which is V squared over rho, uh, in other words, uh, 15 inches squared over 6 inches, that's the normal piece. And then we have the tangential piece that was given, 9 inches per second squared. We can just take a vector sum of those two and calculate the total acceleration of point B. And that would solve the problem. And that's what they'll go through here. I'll let you uh, work that out on your own and look through those slides. I'm going to skip the swinging arm robot slide and go straight to here next. So in general plane motion, a lot of, a lot of really three-dimensional problems can be broken down into something that's either exactly plane motion or fairly close. If you think about a person running, they're basically usually running in a straight line, okay, if they're just jogging along. And so you can think about that person as just moving in a plane. In that case, let's think about their knee. Well, their knee has, according to this, a linear velocity and acceleration for both translation. In other words, the, runner, the runner's body itself is moving forward and the rotation because the, the whole leg is rotating about the hip as each foot is put forward in the stride. And so the linear velocity of the knee comes partially from the forward motion of the entire body, but sometimes the leg's moving forward ahead of the body, so that knee has even more velocity. Sometimes it's moving backwards on a power stroke, so it has less. It may still have some forward velocity, right? But it doesn't have as much as the general body has. Same thing with the acceleration, right? In other words, whenever you have a something that allows freedom in a body that's connected together, so you can think of it as multiple bodies, a torso, an upper leg, and a lower leg, as well as, of course, a foot. Um, there can be different velocities, but relationship between all those bodies. So in general plane motion, what we usually do is think of the body uh, as moving as a sum of two different uh, motions. So a general plane motion you see on the left there, We've got uh, the center at point A1, and then it moves over to point A2. And we're tracking point B, where it moves from state 1, B1, over to state 2, B2. The wheel's just rolled on the ground. Well, that's equivalent, or is equal to, a pure translation of the body without any rotation, and then a rotation in place. So that's how we're going to um, analyze this, is just as a sum of those, those two things, which is what the slides are saying. So if we consider the displacement of two points in any body, A1, B1, then we can always divide it into translation of the body and then rotation about one of the points. Uh, so if you notice here, the body moves from A1, B1 to A2, B1 prime. That's an intermediate for B1, or for, yeah, for point B1 and then finally moves to the actual B2. Now, in the real world, the whole motion occurs at once. But for our purposes, we can break it up, and that simplifies our analysis. Now, in order to deal with this, we have to deal with relative things. So not only can we consider it as a position like that in a move, we can consider this as a velocity as well. So if we talk about the velocity of two points, uh, A and B, in a body, we can consider those two velocities as velocities in the same direction of the same amount plus an angular velocity. Okay, so that the sum of the, let's look at this, uh, it's going to rotate about A, so the sum of the velocity of point B that's equivalent to A plus the rotation of the body about A, that relative velocity, uh, those two together give the true velocity of point B. And so the equation says that the velocity of point B is the same as the velocity of point A, that's the figure in the middle, plus the relative velocity between points A and B as the body moves from the initial position, uh, well, is moving in its current position. So we'll use this relative velocity idea over and over again. And the nice thing about it is that that relative velocity will always be fairly simple. It will simply be the angular speed of the body multiplied by the vector between points A and B. So that makes it easy because that relative velocity is always relatively straightforward to calculate, assuming you know the angular speed. 
So then we can write the, the relative motion equation we had at the top as the velocity b equals the velocity of a plus omega cross with the vector from a to b. And this is just representing the, uh, you know, the translation is the first piece. And that's the way you should think about this equation, this relative velocity equation, is that that first term va represents the translation piece. And that VB with respect to A, that relative velocity represents the rotation piece. So it breaks down really nicely. I like how it, it matches the, the, the figures we have here. So VB goes with the general body velocity on the left-hand side. The equal sign matches exactly. VA is the pure translation. And then the relative velocity is the rotation piece out at the end. All right, now this is a mechanism that we've already analyzed with uh, all the instant centers. But uh, you should recognize one of them here in a minute. They're not going to use the uh, instant centers at infinity that we know about. Uh, they're going to use just one instant center, and that is the instant center of the link about ground. But we'll get to that in just a minute. So if you think about this mechanism moving, where A is moving to the right and B is moving down, we'd like to relate the velocity of A to the velocity of point B. And so what we can do is imagine that the whole body has a velocity to the right plus some uh, sort of rotational velocity about the pivot. And if we just add up those two terms in the right amounts, we'll get the velocity of B. Now, one thing to, to note here is to understand the constraints of the mechanism. A can only have a horizontal velocity. B can only have a vertical velocity. So the VA that you see at the top of the center uh, figure, along with the relative velocity, VB, with respect to A, those two vectors have to sum to a vector that is vertical. So we end up with a, a velocity triangle that looks like what we've got on the right. You see where the velocity A plus the velocity B with respect to A sum to a vector that is vertical and going downward if A is going to the right. So when your author says that the direction of the velocity B is known, what he means is by looking at the mechanism, B has to slide up and down. And the relative velocity is known because, again, we're analyzing these velocities as sort of a translation and rotation. And the rotation, uh, or the relative velocity, has to be perpendicular to the point between A and B, or the line, I should say, between A and B. That's the only way it can happen, right? The body has to stick together, and so it has to rotate about uh, A. Now, to relate the velocity at B to the velocity at A, well, just look at the triangle off to the side. And it's, it is helpful to draw these triangles. It's helpful to draw the bodies as the sum of the translation plus the rotation, so it's very clear to you which point it is that you're having translate and which point is fixed then for the rotation. In this case, since the velocity of A was used for the velocity of the whole body in the, that middle figure there, then A also has to be the pivot point. Okay, you can't take B as the pivot point arbitrarily. That won't work. So you'll notice that the relationship uh, between velocity of B and A is just due to the triangle off to the side. In order to actually calculate these things, you have to dig in a little bit deeper and realize that uh, the velocity of A and the, the relative velocity of B with respect to A are related by a cosine function. So that's what we've got here in these next set of equations. But also realizing that the relative velocity of b with respect to a is really a length, the length of the link, times the angular velocity, that's the key, right? That the angular velocity always comes out as an angular speed times a length. And so then you can solve for the angular speed of the link if that's what you want. And of course, we've got two equations now, one that involves the velocity of b in terms of the velocity of a, and the other one that gives us the angular speed of the link in terms of the velocity of A as well. <clears throat> now, we could have selected B as the reference instead and said, well, let's just pretend the whole body is moving just like B is moving, which is moving down. And then we hold B constant and allow rotation about B. In that case, our velocity triangle would come out very similar, right? Um, and going through the same sorts of, of equations, we'd get the same thing. So you'll notice that the velocity of A with respect to B, this relative velocity vector, is equal and opposite to what we had before. Okay? That's the way it would always turn out to be. 
So the angular velocity, here's something that throws students off. The angular velocity that you get about point B is the exact same magnitude as what you've got about point A. As a matter of fact, the angular velocity of the body is just the same no matter what point you pick. And students get really confused about that. It's kind of like torque. You know that torque is an angular type thing. Have you ever uh, jacked up the, your car to get your wheel off, so you got a flat tire or something, and you've forgotten to loosen the lug nuts, and you put your wrench on the lug nut, and you start to, to crank it over, you apply force to the wrench, and all of a sudden the wheel spins. And you realize the wheel is spinning about its axis of rotation, about the bearing, but it seems strange that you could apply a torque off-center, and yet the wheel start rotating. Well, torques and angular velocities, angular accelerations, all these things are interesting in that they're, it doesn't matter what point you take, you'll get the same values of these things. They have the same effect on the body, too. Torque, it doesn't matter where you apply torque on a body, you'll get the same angular acceleration. Now, there's another example problem. Again, I have my own. I won't go through them. I'll leave these for you to go through the slides. These are good example problems. There's a second one here with a piston cylinder device, or what we know is a uh, slider crank. Uh, good example. Please do go through it. Uh, I think it'll help you, but like I said, I've got my own examples that I've recorded, and I, I want you to watch those as well. All right, I pause this because the next question, uh, the next slide, is a group problem solving, and I want to do this just as if we were in class. So if you have to pause to think about this, do pause the video and think about it because this, it's valuable. Okay, so in the position shown, notice we're, we always care about in the position shown, okay? We don't care about what happens next. We care about right now. Bar AB, okay, so that's the upper length that's 7 inches long, has an angular velocity of 4 radians per second clockwise. Okay, so it's rotating clockwise about A. That makes sense. Determine the angular velocity of bars B, D, and D, E. And they go on and they, they solve it. Uh, I'm going to help you think through this intuitively, uh, how the solution should go. But first of all, let's answer this, this interesting question. It says, which of the following is true? The direction of the velocity of point B is straight up. The direction of the velocity of point D is to the right. And both A and B are correct. So we've got to decide, is A correct? Is B correct? If so, then C is what's correct. So let's start off with the velocity of point B. Well, if BA, or AB as they called it, is rotating clockwise, well then point B is just to the left of point A. Now as it moves, yeah, point B is just going to move straight up, isn't it? There's no way that B can be moving to the right or to the left because it'd have to break away from that that pivot point at A. So B has to be moving either up or down, and since it's going clockwise, well, B is just moving straight up. So A is certainly true. So either, either answer A or answer C is going to be correct. How about the direction of the velocity of point D? Well, you might look at this, and at first you'd be confused because you'd say, well, I understand how point B is moving up. Point B is a point on link AB. It's also a point on link BD, that vertical member. And I know that point B is moving up on that vertical member, but I'm not so sure how D is moving. You might try to think intuitively and say, well, would the link at this position for some reason just be going straight up? Here's an easier way to think about it. What about thinking about point E? If you think about link DE, the velocity of point D has to be perpendicular to link DE, or points, the line connecting point DE. And so the velocity of point D, it doesn't matter if DE is moving clockwise or counterclockwise, the velocity is going to have to be perpendicular to a line between D and E. And so point D, since it's a point on DE, but it's also a point on BD, it has to move not in a vertical direction, right? So VD, there's no way that it's going to be vertical, but that's not what they suggested. They suggested this move to the right. Well, there's no way it could be moving completely to the right. The velocity of point D has to be perpendicular to a line between D and E. So it would have a component to the right, but it would also have a component upward. So what that tells us is that B is not true, therefore C is not true, and so A would be our, our correct answer. Now, I said I'd also go through the thought process of solving the actual question, which is uh, AB has an angular velocity of 40 radians per second. 
uh, clockwise, determine the angular velocity of bars BD and, and DE. I want to help you understand just intuitively how these things would be rotating. Not necessarily the magnitude, but just intuitively how they'd be rotating. This is a very useful skill to develop. So pause the video and see if you can figure it out, and then I'll talk through it and see if you got it right. So if AB is rotating clockwise, we just discovered that point B is moving straight up, and point D, well, for BD to remain the same length and not break apart, D can't have a component downward. It's got to have a component upward. And that means that D would be moving up and to the right. Well, if D is moving up and to the right, but B is moving straight up, then isn't the angular velocity of BD counterclockwise? I mean, it, it would have to be, right? And similarly, if point D is moving up and to the right, then link DE is rotating clockwise as well. So AB is rotating clockwise, that was given. DE is rotating clockwise, but BD is rotating counterclockwise in this instance. So your author will go through and actually solve the problem. I would suggest in these group problem solving uh, steps that you go through them um, by literally starting the presentation and clicking through and try to figure out how you would solve it before you click through. Now, I have uh, grayed out this slide because they had a copy paste uh, to talk about the solution and they unfortunately copied the statement for the solution from the previous example. They worked the problem correctly but they then uh, they just made that statement that was wrong so I, I hit it. Um, but you can trust that, that uh, solution. Okay, so finally they're going to talk about instantaneous centers. So if you think about a, a point and a body, here's a general body, it's the <laughs> typical potato body we seem to draw in dynamics. And point A is moving down and to the right with some velocity, VA, but the whole body is rotating as well. Well, how would we locate the point where the body appears to rotate about it at this instance. Well, what you could do is realize that the, well, the key is to realize that the instant center has to lie on a line through A that is perpendicular to A. So you see that that's been drawn down here. And if you choose a point far enough away from A, you'll finally find a point on the body that has no velocity. And that's the point where the instant center is located. Now, in our, the terminology and the, the method I've taught you so far, this is an instant center of the body with respect to ground because it's a point that's not moving. And so the way they say it is that you just find a point along that line where um, you can reconcile the velocity of A with the angular velocity omega where the length r is equal to the velocity of a divided by omega, and that's certainly how you can calculate that, that distance. Um, but notice that this is an instant center. It's a point that's on the body, but it's off the body. Notice that's a point where we've imagined extending the body, and we could pin the body to ground at point C and for this instance and get the exact same kind of motion that the body has. Okay, uh, let's see. I think we've already talked through all of this, so that's not really all that useful. So yeah, so this is the instantaneous center of rotation. Now this is a ground pivot, is what we would call it in the method that I've used, or an instant center one slash, or I1, and then I guess body, uh, whatever the body number would be, two for example. Now this is an important thing to consider. This can help you understand the instant center method that I gave you. Imagine that you have a body that has two points A and B, and you know the velocities of points A and B. Well, the instant center of rotation of that body has to lie on a line perpendicular through A and passing through A. It also has to lie on a line perpendicular to the velocity at B and through point B. Where those two lines intersect would have to be necessarily the instant center. Now, you should pause the video and think about it this for a moment if it doesn't make a lot of sense. But in any other case, the body would have to tear itself apart. There's no other way that this could happen. So if you need to pause the video, do that. Now, 
just for a moment, imagine that the vectors coming off of points A and B were parallel to each other. In fact, imagine going from the way they look now to where B gets closer and closer and closer, or I'm sorry, the velocity of B gets closer and closer and closer to parallel with A. And you can imagine how those two lines would go out farther and farther and cross, and that, that instant center would move all the way out to infinity. Maybe this will help you understand what I was talking about when I said that a body in pure translation has an instant center with respect to ground, or in relation to ground, at infinity in either direction. So one thing that would confuse you about this particular method that we're looking at is that the instant center, once those two velocity vectors are parallel to each other, that instant center is either at infinity going up away or down the other side. And you can imagine that by allowing the vector to continue past parallel. Right, so if B rotates to where, or I'm sorry, the velocity of B rotates to the point where it's parallel to A, and then rotates a little bit more, well now the two lines intersect on the opposite side of the body. So it's like the point went up to infinity and came back around to negative infinity. Now, <clears throat> let's consider uh, the body with two other points, A and B, in a totally different situation now, where point A and point B uh, lie on a line that is perpendicular to both of them. In that case, the instant center lies at a point where, well, it's going to be on that line, right, between A and B, because both of the velocity vectors are perpendicular to it. But if the velocity at B and the velocity at, at A are different, you could draw them to scale, connect their two tips with a line, and wherever that intersects, the, the line that goes through A and B would be the instant center. And a way to understand this is to consider just a wheel. Just imagine a, a pinwheel, for example. Okay, so you're holding a, a stick that has a pinwheel on it. You probably had one as a child. You'd blow on it, it would turn. Um, or you'd run through the, you know, the air and it would turn. Well, if you look at that pinwheel, what's the linear velocity of the center point if you're just looking at it and blowing on it? Well, it's nothing, right? That's the center of rotation. And as you move out farther and farther and farther, along the blades on the pinwheel, the, the tangential velocity gets higher and higher. This is something that's particularly important when you think about something like a windmill for generating power. The farther out you go on those blades, which they're very long blades, the faster it's moving. It's actually pretty easy to uh, get to a speed that doesn't look very fast, but where the tip is breaking the sound barrier. It's, it's, you know, its tangential velocity is so high. So anyway, the farther away the point is in the body from the instant center of rotation, the, the faster it's moving. So hopefully that makes some sense. Now, if the velocity of point A and B are parallel and the, their magnitudes are equal, then again we're going to get two lines that are parallel to each other, and the body's in pure translation, the instant center is off at infinity, and again, either positive or negative infinity, in the direction of those lines. It's important to understand it's not just positive or negative infinity with the coordinate system going horizontal or vertical. It's along these lines that relate the velocity of A and B. So finally we get to what we've known for quite a while now, and that is that the instant center of the link uh, that links the two sliders is at C. Because notice that the body at point A is in pure translation horizontal, the body at point B is pure vertical translation, and so the instant centers between ground and those bodies are at infinity, but of course you and I know that your book doesn't talk about the instant center that's actually at point A and point B, and connecting the instant center at point A with the instant center at infinity, you get the vertical line that passes through C, connecting the instant center at B with the instant center at infinity for, for that body intersects the, the vertical line and gives you point C, which is the instant center of the connecting link. So um, something important to understand is that if you know the velocity of point A, well, uh, talking about the linear velocity, you can calculate the angular velocity of the whole body pretty easily. Remember, we're considering point C to be a point on the body. And so at this instant, the whole body is just rotating about C and if that's the case, then the velocity of any particular point on the body is just proportional to the distance between that point and the center of rotation. So all we really need is the distance between A and C, which is not really a dimension on this link, right? It's just a dimension at this particular position. But again, we're simply using vehicles omega r, 
where r is the distance between a and c now. And it's easy to calculate based on geometry. It's just the length of the link times the cosine of the angle theta. The velocity of point B can be computed similarly. And at this point, you should realize that the velocity of point B has to be less than the velocity of point A. Why? Well, because B is closer to the rotation center at C. A is farther away. So A has to have a larger linear velocity than B has. It's, it's simple. So BC times omega would give you the velocity of point B. And of course, if we've calculated the angular velocity from point A, imagine that we know the velocity of point A then we can get the velocity at point B in terms of the velocity at point A, which is the same thing we had before. Same equations. So the velocities of all the particles in the rod are just acting like they're rotating about C. That, that position, though, that center of rotation has exactly zero linear velocity. It has an angular velocity, but you can't really say that a point has angular velocity. The body has angular velocity. Now, one thing you've got to be careful about, we're only analyzing this position. I can't stress that enough. We're only analyzing this position. So the, the important thing here is that that instant center is going to move around. If you go to a new position, all bets are off. That old instant center is dead. You've got to find the new one okay, and figure out where it's at and use those dimensions then. Uh, the acceleration of particles in this slab, the body, can't be uh, determined as if the slab were simply rotating about C. The, the acceleration is a little more complicated. We'll get into that in the next le lecture. This next point is not all that important. Um, you can trace the locus of the um, uh, instant center relative to the body, and that's what's called the body centroid. You can also trace that point relative to where it's actually at in space, and that's called the space centroid, but we're not going to use that at all. At the instant shown, what is the approximate direction of the velocity of point G, the center of the bar AB. Well, again, all you really have to do is draw a line between the center of rotation and the point of interest, and then the velocity will be perpendicular to that line, and so that's why C is the answer here. So now let's consider this group solving problem. In the position shown, bar AB, let's see, that's one that's 250 millimeters long, has an angular velocity of 4 radians per second clockwise, so it's point B is moving down apparently. Determine the angular velocity of bars BD and DE. Well, let's start off by thinking about how they have to move. Let's see. BD, well, let's see. If point B is moving down, looking at DE, well, then point D has to be moving down as well. And this is a general principle. In one of the videos that I posted, I think it was a Learn Engineering video, they pointed out that if you draw a line between any two points um, on a body, those two points have to have the exact same linear velocity component along that line. They can have a different component perpendicular to the line, but along that line they have to have the exact same magnitude. Otherwise the body will come apart. Right? It'll either squish together or come apart, and we're assuming these are all rigid bodies. So point D has to have the same amount of velocity as point B along the line between B and D, but there has to be some more velocity per, for point D, right? Because it's at an angle, right? I mean, D has to move along a, a line, or its, it's velocity, well, D moves along a line that's a circle about E, but D at this point has a tangential velocity that's tangent to that circle, and that tangential velocity line is perpendicular to the line between D and E. So that tells me that point D is moving faster than point B. Now, that's not what they asked for. They asked about the angular velocities. So the angular velocity of, of BD, well, let's see. If B is moving down, D is also moving down, but also to the left. So that means that BD is rotating clockwise, right? And of course, DE is rotating counterclockwise in this particular position. They said, okay, what is the velocity of point B? Well, you know that the angular velocity is 4 radians per second. Actually, I'll let you go through this. This is not all that difficult to understand. There was a, a little thing at the end that was difficult. You might wonder why they've got this angle beta here when really beta was 
down on DE. Well, what they're doing, I don't like one of the things about the way this problem is set up. That's why I'm going through this. It turns out that the instant center C for this intermediate link BD is right on top of point A, and that's that can confuse students very easily. So just watch out for that. It's just in this position that this happens to be this way. And of course you can find that, remember one of the things I said at the beginning was that you have to solve the geometry problem first. That's what they're doing. They're finding the distances between B in the instant center and D in the instant center. And then calculating the angular velocity of BD based on knowing the velocity of point B. How do they know the velocity of point B? Well, that was from the original link. Let's go back. That's from knowing the angular speed of link AB. That's how they found the, that's the equation on the upper right. That's how they found the linear speed of point B. So calculating the angular speed of link BD is actually not all that difficult once you have the instant center for BD. And again, this point C is an instant center on ground, which is another reason why this problem can be a little more confusing. Now to find the angular speed of body DE, now they're not, unfortunately this slide doesn't show you which link they're talking about. They're talking about the one on the lower right, DE. Okay, they've taken care of BD. Now they're saying, well, since we know the velocity of D, and that's a velocity on DE, we should be able to find the angular speed of DE, which you can. Now I want to warn you a little bit down here. This equation makes sense, right? The velocity of point D equals DC, that's this distance from here to here, because here's the instant center for BD. BD is just rotating about that point, times the angular speed of BD. Okay, that's all well and good. We already know omega BD, the angular speed, because we solved for it before. And we know the distance, DC, so coming up with a velocity of point D in terms of magnitude is easy. And then they write another equation. If you don't watch it, you'll start to get confused between the DCs and the DEs and all these things. What they've done here is they've transitioned to the other link, the link that's connected from D to E, which is a ground point. E is a ground point. And they're saying, well, this is the same velocity on body DE at point D. And so they say, well, the velocity, I can't get my mouse back, there it is. The velocity of point D equals the length of that link, D to E, the ground pivot, times the angular speed of that link, D, E. That's all they're doing here, is they're using V equals omega R all over the place, right? They used it for B, D, now they're using it for D, E, and that's, that's well and good, that's how we do this. But then they know, well, we already know the velocity of point D. Now, here they've kind of taken too many steps, you might miss this. Four times a quarter is just one, that's where this came from. They're just writing this, by putting it all together. And the radians went away from free, for free, so you just have meters per second. And then the right-hand side of the equation, you'll notice that the length of uh, link DE, uh, they wrote it as 150 millimeters, but that's the same thing as 0.15 meters. Okay, so uh, the length, and I'm, I'm wrong about that. I'm wrong about that. Hang on, let's go back. Uh, the length of DE, E is not known. Here's the 150 millimeter length, and what they're doing is they're relating this horizontal length that's known to the angle. Sorry, I forgot that that wasn't the length of the link. All they're doing here is using geometry to find the length of link DE, and that's, that's easy. And they're saying, well, multiplied by the angular speed of the link, and this equation is true, because this side we know is the velocity D, this we know is the length of DE, and so the uh, angular speed of DE is only the only thing that's left and so you can solve for it it comes out to six and two-thirds radians per second.